Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss data modeling best practices, business and technical approaches sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies and we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar to do so just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature and if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar or follow Donna further you may do so at community.dataversity.net as always we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar now let me turn it over to Andrew Oliver from Couchbase for a word from our sponsor. Andrew, hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so Couchbase is pleased to be sponsoring today's webinar on data modeling. While some people prematurely declare data modeling dead because of NoSQL databases like Couchbase, we at Couchbase think that data modeling is actually more important than ever due to trends like NoSQL and cloud computing. Couchbase is a leading cloud-native JSON document database and key value store adopted by the likes of Amadeus, American Express, and Tesco. Database development was more or less static for 30 years after the widespread commercialization of the relational database in the 80s. However, an increase in both the amount and different types of data people are generating created a need for a new type of database. Not only is more flexibility needed today, but much higher scale and lower latency than can be accomplished with traditional vertical architecture databases. Think about that flexibility for a moment. In the 90s and early 2000s, we had a lot more payment and communication types emerge. Anyone working on an RDBMS back then remembers the schema changes when people started having mul a multitude of communication methods from way more phone numbers to email addresses to chat clients and home pages. Now imagine those consumer devices and even embedded devices. There are more and more every day. There are also different types of metadata and associated data like sensor reads and attributes. It simply isn't possible to create a relatively static table structure that captures all the fields and field changes efficiently. We have to adapt both our database and our modeling techniques to this new world. Now I gave kind of a consumer and manufacturing sort of example, but you're seeing this, I'm, I'm sure all of you are seeing this throughout enterprises and software and, and what have you, where there's, there's more and more different types of things and attributes uh, than you could uh, capture in that more traditional static table structure. Yet we can't give up. The pattern of the JavaScript developer with no modeling and architecture experience who just haphazardly creates an object model and persists it in the data store doesn't work so well in a large-scale production or enterprise application. We're dealing with some of the, the negative effects of that, you know, with a lot of the software that's out there today. NoSQL databases like Couchbase add and remove concepts from our data modeling lexicon. The conceptual model is a lot closer to the physical model. We no longer have the requirement for attribute tables just because we don't know how many phone numbers somebody may have. We gain the ability to map high volume simplicity data to key value stores. Just a thing with a key. Just a warning that while key value stores aren't couch based specific, having both a document store and a key value in the same place is couch based specific. Okay, everybody, uh, everyone can hear okay? Yep, you're fine. Okay, cool. Uh, NoSQL databases add concepts like buckets, uh, but we do away with tables. There are collections and items and events, for instance, instead of triggers. Not everything is new, but some things are a bit different, like the way indexes work. Also, when you're mapping an entity in a document database like Couchbase, you have the option to either reference the dependent object or embed it. As usual, you just have to think through things like the transactionality or life cycle of the object. Meanwhile, as NoSQL databases have matured, some things are getting less different. It used to be in a document database, for instance, you had to put everything you wanted 
uh, an asset guarantee into one document. These days, Couchbase, among others, support transactions. Ironically, Couchbase, a NoSQL database, also supports SQL. Meanwhile, some RDBMSs are now, uh, now support storing JSON documents in the columns of the database. It isn't exactly the same as a document database, but it is a uh, uh, coming together of sorts. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. I took a college class on data modeling in the late 90s. We used Irwin and then created models and even reverse engineered existing database models. With my first job in the late 90s, I used Irwin on SQL Server. Today, you can use Irwin on NoSQL databases like Couchbase, even reverse engineer an existing model. So while things have changed and data modeling techniques have to take that into account, it's nice to know how much hasn't changed. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Shannon. Andrew, thank you so much. And if you have questions for Andrew, or uh, we, he will be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the presentation today. So feel free to submit your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that. And now let me introduce the speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert from information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategies uh, Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. She was just, in fact, with us last week at the Data Architecture Summit in Chicago. And with that, let me get the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Always a pleasure to be on these. And for those of you who were in Chicago last week, it's always nice. I often at my sessions ask how many people see see these online and get a good show of hands. So it's always, and a lot of you do come up in person and say hi, which I always appreciate. So. Much appreciated, um, and thanks for joining today, where we will be going deeper into what Andrew sort of started to talk about, which was data modeling, uh, both from the business perspective. Very happy that uh, Andrew brought up the idea of a conceptual data model, because I do think that's kind of the lingua franca across a lot of different technology types. Um, but we'll also talk about some of the technology approaches, because as he mentioned, that there's a lot of change in the industry, and, and how, how and where the data models still apply. Uh, for those of you who uh, this may be your first webinar, um, <clears throat> just wanted to let you know that this is a yearly um, uh, series, and all of the previous series are on demand, I think, forever, uh, out on the Dataversity site, uh, so you can catch all of them, including this one, if um, either you want to pass it to a colleague or join it again. Um, and do join us next month, or in December, the next one, the last one for the year. Uh, I know at the end of the year a lot of people are starting to plan next year and what does their new future state data architecture look like. And with all the changes in the in industry, it's a good time to kind of step back over the holiday period and, and think about that. So we'll be chatting about that in the December time frame. Uh, but without further ado, uh, today's topic is on data modeling. And <clears throat> I want to reiterate what Andrew mentioned that, you know, the uh, I'm not sure why that even came up, that data modeling would go away <laughs> with some of these new technologies, but that did was sort of the buzz for a while, and that buzz is going away. We've done a few data diversity uh, surveys, and, and over and over again, uh, I think one of them, uh, the survey respondents, 97% of organizations in that particular survey were, were using a data model. So certainly not going away. Uh, they're changing. They're evolving. I completely agree with that. That's part of the fun of being in data management today. There's so many different choices. And I thought it was also interesting when Andrew mentioned that there's a lot of merging uh, between the technologies. There's a lot of good approaches, and what used to be in a document is now in a database and vice versa. So kind of adds to the complexity, but also the fun. But I think one of the appeal of data models is that it can take that complexity and turn it into a, an intuitive visual way that not only can the technical team benefit, but also business stakeholders more and more and you've probably heard my other webinars, I'm a big fan of mentioning this and discussing this and building strategies around the fact that business and IT are merging as well. What a, quote, business stakeholder and what a technical stakeholder is is starting to merge, and more and more, quote, business people are really interested in tech, uh, might not want to code, might not want to look at DDL, um, but do want to understand the data structures, and that is a great way for a data model because it can really bridge those two worlds. As data management professionals and as data modelers, we love our definitions, so I thought we'd kind of start out of what is a data model, and if you are new. Um, this first definition is from um, my colleagues, Steve Hoberman and Chris Bradley, that in our uh, data modeling for the business book. 
uh, where we tried to step it back, and it really is that that set of simple symbols to communicate concepts and the business rules around it. And, and I think that's um, often we use that idea of an architectural diagram for a house, <laughs> and that you know we often do. You know, if you're going to have a house built, you might have sort of an architectural diagram. Why do we use that? I've never built a house before. I don't know what an archi- I don't know how to wire um, <laughs> all the electricity in my house, but I'm glad somebody. Does and I'm I'm really glad that that can be communicated in a really clear way. All I have to do is look at those simple pictures, and I basically get a, a sense that you know there's a house behind this, and there's rooms, and there's electrical wiring to go to different rooms, and that sort of thing. Um, so not only does it uh, convey these images in a technical way, but it shows the relationships between concepts and objects, and we'll talk a lot about that. I think that is some of the value. It's not just the boxes on a model, but the lines between them. Um, Taking another definition from the Damon Dictionary of Data Management, it's a model that includes those formal names that I mentioned, the definitions are so important, um, the proper data structures, and these precise data integrity rules. So uh, w- often these look very simple, and I'll show you examples later in the presentation if you're not familiar with data modeling, but there's some, there's, simplicity can belie underlying value, right? Something as simple as, um, to use example, um, Andrew gave, you know, can a can a customer have more than one email address? Can they have a text and a, a cell phone? Uh, we've probably all had some of the negative customer experiences where those business rules, you know, weren't weren't in the system. Can I have a PO box and a mailing address, or am I getting my mail at the wrong place? Some of these very simple business rules can really have downstream business effects. So that's where these models come in handy. The <clears throat> other nice thing about a model, and I've been in modeling for a long time now is that they are in active use across a wide variety of, of industries. And that's one of the reasons I'm still in this industry, because it's fun. And I think if you're it, it, as long in the industry as some of us on this call and, and myself are, we've probably all done our stint in financial services or insurance or government, and, and although there's nothing wrong with those industries, I think what's sort of fun is there's such a diverse set of industries we can work on now that everyone's sort of coming wise to the fact that data models can help. So. I tried to take some real-world use cases from our practice. Um, as you know, data, global data strategy does this for a living, and, and we have a lot of fun with it, and partly because there's just um, so many people interested in data nowadays. Uh, the first one we'll actually talk about again, environmental data sampling. Uh, the UK Environment Agency actually was on with us earlier this year in December, so you can always see that webinar again, um, of how they use data models for kind of environmental sampling. Um, <clears throat> I think my favorite one is that second box, early childhood development. So we're actually doing a project with a Head Start program outside of Detroit, and, and they and these are early childhood educators going on a whiteboard and building a data model. And, and for those of you who say that, you know, quote, business people, and, and I don't like that term either, business person. In that case, it's a teacher, right? A business person <laughs> could be, you know, a scientist. Uh, we kind of use that very broadly. Um, I, I think we gave them a five slide, what is a data model and what is cardinality and what do these things mean, <laughs> uh, one to many, and, and that um, <clears throat> that kind of definition. And with that, they were building their own data models and kind of arguing, can a, is a virtual classroom the same as a regular classroom, and can a classroom have more than one teacher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, I think that's the beauty of these models across industries. Everybody can understand them very quickly and really get to the crux of some core data issues. Uh, E-commerce and digital transformation, we've got several customers uh, using data models for that now. And again, that sort of uh, goes in the face of data models being old school. These are, these are companies that are looking to completely transform their business from either brick and mortar to digital or um, from very you know traditional transactional to more e-commerce. And the first thing they do is build out a data model. What, what is the same and, and what is different? Is, is mobile number more important than perhaps you know the landline or et cetera, et cetera? Do we even use email anymore in this new world? Um, and that is all discussed through a data model. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, back to uh, uh, education. We did a large data model um, for a university out in the Midwest, and they were trying to really understand their u- student journey. And what is a student? <laughs> is a student an online student who might be coming back from, you know, might be a military person that's doing this part time, or a, a mother with a child on their lap, or someone on campus? All these kind of core data definitions uh, were done through the data model. Um, to the bottom, we had a water utility uh, kind of doing some data modernization. They were trying to do some digital modernization, and they used a data model. Uh, we have a construction company, and they're really trying to understand how they can better bid their work and kind of do benchmarking across 
uh, when they bid the work and when they developed the work, first thing they wanted to do was build a data model. Um, agile software development, I want to bring that up because that's another kind of elephant in the room of uh, we don't do data modeling, uh, we're agile. I, I, good news is I hear that less and less um, because I, I think people are realizing uh, that you can't skip that step or you're going to come back and do it again. Um, and so, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation, doesn't mean you have to build a enterprise data model that takes a year and a half. You can do, you know, I, I think some sort of enterprise view is important to start with, but then you can break down your data model into kind of chunks and do it in an agile manner. Um, customer centricity, that last example, we have a lot of organizations really looking to understand customer. Those of you in the call who have done data modeling probably more than 10 minutes, you've probably done some sort of what is a customer type data model. Um, this is a membership organization in Europe we're working with, and they're really trying to understand what is a member of their organization. Is an online member? Is it a subscribing member? Is it a et cetera, et cetera? And then all of the touch points with their different products. Um, and they used a data model for that. So hopefully those may, might have jogged some thoughts in your head that it isn't the traditional data model that you might have done and not necessarily even the traditional in industry. Uh, I would say almost any um, any industry that you were on on this call could use a data model. In fact, one of our clients, uh, again, she was a, quote, business user. She was a scientist, had never done, quote, data models before, and she came back the next day and said, I modeled my kitchen. I'm a baker, and I really wanted to organize my cabinets, and the first thing I did was a data model, and they are addicting. Um, and so once you sort of get that mindset in your head, you often will be building these data models just for sort of life events, because they're just a very simple way to, to really simplify complex topics. Um, so I mentioned this before with um, the idea of agile or, or skipping data modeling. And again, I see that less and less. Uh, but remember, my mother always said, if you don't have time to do it right, you have time to do it again. And that is really where data modeling comes from. So this is, yes, I will put cartoons in this presentation because there are data modeling cartoons. And since I have them, I must use them because it's just a very unique thing. Um, but this might not make anyone else who's not a data modeler laugh, but or maybe not even you, but I'll try. Um, this idea that these people are all the way through acceptance testing and everything looks great and we're going to build this new marketing application. Just a question, what, what's a customer? Are we going to define that? Um, and that might not seem funny to you. Um, until you've been on a project where this has happened. And I would say, ugh, I've been in the industry forever doing this, and even just this year we have had three separate customers do those very embarrassing type of what is a customer mistakes, like sending renewal notices to people who aren't customers, uh, sending uh, please buy this product to customers, uh, sending out too many emails to the same customer because they have more than one address. Uh, we had one, actually two, two of our customers did this. They actually sent mailings to uh, somebody, physical mailings, and one poor individual, one was in Europe and one was in the U.S., got thousands of mailings. Um, and I can picture in my head in the data model what happened, and you might as well. Um, and you might have thought somebody in the human uh, side of that might have noticed that one individual is getting a thousand magazines or a thousand letters. Um, but that's the type of thing that happens, and they sound so ridiculous. And somebody who's not in data could say, how on earth could a company do this? And those of you who have done data modeling might actually know some of these mistakes you can be by just having a cardinality wrong or just missing a relationship between two core entities that have to do with customer or getting the definition of customer. Is it a, a lapsed customer? Is it a, a membership customer? Is it a customer with maintenance? Is it a prospective customer um, where they haven't bought the product, but we're going to call them a customer because we'd like them to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is why um, data models are important. I think it's also important to note that all data models aren't created equal um, and that there are different levels for different audiences. So especially if you're a large organization, you may even just want to start at the high level or enterprise or subject area level. You know, what are our core buckets of information? We have product, we have invoicing, we have you know, sales, or however you want to do those different subject areas, just to start that grouping. Uh, generally, um, I always start with some sort of conceptual layer, and that really is those core business rules. That gets down to what is a customer, what is a member, what is an employee, um, and their concepts and rules around them. And, and for those of you who might say, isn't that a little academic, do we need to do it? Hopefully by the end of the presentation we'll show you the value of that. Um, but I also would say in the spirit of Agile, or being more Agile, um, you can do these things very quickly. I have, you know, we've mapped out workshops with a data model with either a whiteboard or sticky notes or just conversations in an afternoon or 
you know, I'll give you an example later of when we did in a week, um, and it was pretty much complete um, and usable, and we had actually uncovered a lot of core business issues just by kind of mapping that out with some key business and technical stakeholders. Logical takes it one level down, where, yes, it's still at the business level, and we'll talk more about that, uh, but you are getting into more of the detailed business rules, um, data structures, not database structures, not, you know, sorry, platform structures, but think of hierarchies or relationships between things. Um, and I would still say that is, is a business level, maybe more your data architects, um, but definitely more at the business focus. And then when you're getting down to the physical, that really is where we're thinking of a physical table. Is it a relational database? Is it a key value store? Is it a you know XML schema, COBOL copybook, whatever? Um, and that is important at that stage. I don't want to belittle that. Um, but I also want uh, to also mention the focus up at the conceptual level where you really don't want to skip that because that's getting your, your business rules. The question we often get is, where do you start? This can be complex, and, and you don't want to ignore the existing technical environment, but you don't want to ignore the business either. So do we start with a top-down? Do we start with a bottom-up? Or do we kind of do a mix of the middle? I think in reality it is that mix in the middle and do an iterative approach. I mean, in a perfect world, and, and, and probably in general, I always start with the top-down because that's the, that's the why. Uh, you know, what are we doing? What, what are we prioritizing? Um, because that helps focus, uh, no matter what your company, you probably have too much data that you can actually manage, um, and so you have to prioritize. Uh, physical is great because that shows you the real world, um, and often, and Andrew mentioned this as well, a lot of these data modeling tools, uh, he mentioned Erwin and Brett, others, the Air Studio Power Designer, most good data modeling tools in the market can quote reverse engineer and, and do a great inventory of your physical environment with literally just a click of the button. Um, and if you haven't discovered those tools, please use them. It's a great way to look like a hero <laughs> by uh, creating some of these models and really understanding them. But I think often, um, and it, often you can look like that hero with just one of these aha moments or a few of these aha moments of, you know, I, I, I caught the issue because uh, we in the model where it's an older school model from the 90s and we're restricting somebody to one phone number. Um, well, we can't do that anymore. Now we're trying to text our our customers and we're texting the landlines because there's no way to kind of indicate that this is a mobile phone. seems like such a simple example, but I bet marketing would care about that. I bet marketing could show some ROI. And sometimes just looking at that business level model, what are we trying to do with data? And then looking at the physical model, well, how has it been implemented and vice versa um, can be really uh, eye-opening. Or you might have done, uh, done the business model and then you start looking at the technical environment saying, you know, I never know that we still track the fax number. Huh, should we still do that? Um, and again, it's that iterative approach and you need to do both. Um, I wouldn't really skip either if we're really going to full implementation. If we're starting implementation, I definitely start at that business level because that helps you scope. The problem with you know, just starting at the physical, and you might have done this, and again, you can look like a hero very quickly by creating a physical data model for a, a you know, database with a, a thousand tables, but then what do you do with that? And, and trying to zoom in and really see what that means, that's where the conceptual and logical can help you kind of prioritize based on the, the business value. Um, so if you haven't seen a conceptual data model, this is, is one example um, where this particular tool we're using, I like this one because you can actually show the business definitions right on the, the box. Um, so this is almost looks like something you could do in PowerPoint. Well, what's wrong with that? Business, what do business users live in? PowerPoint. So the more you can make these uh, business data models uh, accessible, the better. And uh, you might have seen some of my presentations before. I don't have any of those cute examples in this one where I actually do put pictures of an employee or a picture of a sales rep or a picture of a product because um, that really can get to the crux of what these models uh, mean. And so I guess uh, my key thing to remember for you to remember when you're building these um, is that what is the focus and who's the audience? The audience is the business um, and you want to keep it simple and you want to keep it focused on the business and business terminology. Um, so, and I've probably made all these mistakes, so I'll just admit them myself, and it's easy, <laughs> easy to do, so don't do them. Um, one is to get too much down into the logical and physical. Um, oh, right there, I could say employee, what's an employee, is it full-time employee, is it part-time employee, what are the different employee types, should we put some attributes? Sometimes that does make sense. You might want the subtype, you might want to put some information in there. Um, but, and, and sometimes it's okay to go to that level of detail and then abstract back 
out again. You might need you to go to that logical to really understand what that entity is, but remember then when you're presenting back to the business, simplify, simplify, simplify. Nothing scares a business person more than a, you know, or any human being <laughs> with this model with a thousand entities. The more you can keep it simple, it can be frustrating because people say, well, you just spent, you know, six months and you have five boxes. Uh, but generally I don't hear that. Generally that clarity is enlightening and people say, great, I've never had someone explain that to me so simply. Thank you. Um, I think the other piece I would recommend um, is not only the simplicity, but use the business language. Uh, that is where you've got to have the um, aha moment. So just use this example. Um, we have a sales rep and a support rep. Are those the same things? Or are they different? We have a customer. Could there be a client? Is a client the same thing as a customer? Um, what, what often people at the sort of academic conceptual level will just say, well, they're all a party. Let's just make a party model. Because, you know, a party has a name and an address. And, yes, that might work at a date, you know, to, to kind of simplify your data structures. But I think you're you're losing a lot of actual business value. I mean, if you oversimplify, you could just have a, you know, two boxes, thing relates to thing, and you get nothing. So I would say when in doubt, um, use the terms of the business and, and just uh, question that and, and try not to use an academic term. Um, actually, we did this on one client. We one of the other consultants actually said, let's have the party model. Um, and the client was, she was great. She goes, a, a modeling party? We're going to have a party. And so we never use the word par party on the model. We actually use client and member. Uh, but we did have a data model party, and our workshop had balloons and cake, and I thought that was great. <laughs> so she kind of turned that on, her, on the head. Uh, but usually that turns people away because the, those types of generic terms can often just seem too abstract. Um, so, you know, but that is where you get things like what's the difference between a customer and a client? Uh, do we have different relationships depending on that uh, interaction? The other thing, and I mentioned the physical model being a great way to sort of inventory, creating an inventory of your data assets, but you could also do that at the conceptual level. And so just starting, and these are all of the tools, um, you know, the, the entities I have in the organization. I have staff, I have location, I have customers, I have weather events linked to locations. This could be anyone from the business saying, I didn't know we tracked that, or a developer going, that's cool. I could also use that for trend analysis. A lot of these um, different areas come out even at the conceptual level of how people are using data and what information they have. So um, it can be a very helpful sort of a roadmap, and a lot of the organizations I work with actually have some of these models on their wall printed with sticky notes on them, um, and it really is your sort of data catalog of, at the high level, what are we tracking in our organization and, and what is our organization? Um, I mentioned before, but when, when you use these great data models, please use the language of the audience. And yes, they kind of start to look like PowerPoints, but they should. <laughs> they should be simple. A customer buys a product. How, we know, let's not overcomplicate that. Uh, don't get too detailed and use business terms as much as you can. Because really the goal of a data model um, is telling a story. Um, and I joke that I, my colleague, uh, Steve Hoberman, who was the co-author of the book that this came from, I think he actually did read data models to his kids <laughs> in the evening. I think he said his daughter was the only girl in kindergarten that could normalize a data model. Um, I think that's a good thing. I'm not sure. Um, but, but we do. We think in stories. We can get the facts. We can get the data. But unless you contextualize that into some sort of so what or some sort of anecdote, um, it's not going to resonate. Uh, I heard in a podcast that someone was talking about, you know, we're so tied into storytelling. Our ancestors told stories around the fire. We can't even sleep without creating stories in our head. They're just sort of always running. We, we just That's sort of how we're wired for whatever reason. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't think you're going to get up there in front of your business stakeholders and say they lived happily ever after. But you do want to relate this to a business scenario. Remember that campaign where we sent too many emails to each customer because we had this problem. Or remember we tried to get a list of our customers and we couldn't because they were duplicates. Remember when we, this is why. And so, or those, it's easy to find kind of the problems, but you can also find opportunities. Wow, if we relate weather data to product sales, we could. Or look at this relationship. What could we do with that? We have the relationship between sales reps and customers. Can we look at how which sales rep has the best relationship with customers or whatever? Some of these relationships you hadn't really thought of. It's a great way to kind of brainstorm and think, aha, about the business. So use them for that way. Create subsets of the models to tell different stories and different scenarios just to kind of tell that through. And you will get a positive experience from the business if you follow most of those uh, 
kind of guidelines. And these are some quotes from our actual real-world living, breathing customers. Um, that early childhood model, one of the teachers got up and said, this is really elegant. You just summed up our organization in a single page. Um, and I think that is the beauty of that. Uh, and we get that a lot. How do you know so much about our company? Uh, actually, that's the one over there in the lower right. Uh, we were at a utility company. Um, and I brag about this one in particular, not because we're particularly smart. Well, maybe we are. I don't know. Um, but it's those data modeling constructs that make you look smart. So we were there for literally a week. We did a bunch of workshops, and we played it back at the end of the week. And this was a fairly complex organization at Water Utility, and they were going digital, and they were looking to do artificial intelligence and a lot of complexity. And we showed the model, and someone said, so how many years have you been here at this company? That was pretty nice. And I said, a week. <laughs> Are you serious? How do you know that? And I said, I, you know, anyone can do that with a data model. That's the beauty of it. You ask some leading questions, you, you get some of these core nouns and verbs of the organization, and it really clarifies some core concepts. Um, uh, Chief Marketing Officer, you know, her concept was, now I get why these campaigns weren't working. We're not linking email with, you know, the other pieces. We're not having some of the relationships. And she had complained that nobody had ever explained that to her before. Everything was very complex. She had a lot of, you know, techie people showing complex diagrams, but no one just ever showed her the crux of the, the so what. Um, and then she sort of liked that. Um, one of my favorite, another favorite, um, was from a technical stakeholder. And we could maybe say, do we need to show uh, data models to the techie team, or is this just for the business folks? Uh, it was a VP of software development at that university I dealt with. And they were building a lot of apps and a lot of new applications for students. And after looking at this data model, where we had sort of broken out the data model into different uh, user types, different types of students. They said, you know, this, we actually also linked it with a process model or a kind of a customer journey map, a uh, student journey map. And he said, you know, I've never seen data from the student's journey before. This was great. And he said it was really eye-opening that he was just thinking of the data points and not the person. And so kind of doing that combination of a customer journey map and a uh, data model was sort of eye-opening. Um, and uh, the last one you will probably get yourself once you start building this. Um, we love it, and we have a couple more departments that want one too. Can you do one for them? And even better, can we use that as a, a conversation mechanism? Um, and again, it's across all industries. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the Environment Agency because uh, they have a whole webinar with us on data diversity. Uh, I think it was earlier this year in uh, February and March. And um, they talked about how these were research scientists that were all doing kind of water samples and air samples, and they were able to use the data model as that sort of common lingua franca between them of is a measurement a measurement and is a, um, is a sample a sample, and, and, some, and it actually showed some efficiencies across the different organizations. And that's another example where your, quote, business user <laughs> were research scientists, and they loved it. That really helped explain things. So data models are great um, at the high level with the conceptual. Um, and what this model did, and I know you can barely see it, but we did start at the conceptual level and then use that, I mentioned earlier, as kind of a roadmap of, of all the things that are most important, what is critical to start with now. So for them, it was measurements, or they were creating also code lists and kind of data standards themselves. And those green boxes were the, the kind of the roadmap for where we want to go into more detail. We're not going to do a detailed data model, logical, physical, and everything, but these are the heat points of the things that are most critical for business value. So from that, we went, um, in that particular example and a lot of others, down into the logical. And that's really where you're going to get into your detailed business rules, your data types, your attributes, um, and your business rules in terms of cardinality and nullability and things like that. Uh, and it does define data structures, but not physical tables. And I want to be clear on that. And I'm, you know, what, what is your sales hierarchy? Can a part here be a raw material, a finished good, or assemble, so, some assembly? There's certain logic in data that has inherent structure, and you want to get that. You're starting to get that. You're not necessarily creating tables from this. Some of the tools, um, especially some of the ones that grew up in the relational world, as most did, it can easily flip and then turn this into a table and create your DDL, which is a great benefit. Um, but I think because of that ease of switching in between and, and they look so similar, I think some people jump to the physical um, model a little too soon. Uh, but stopping a little bit and thinking of just the business rules can have a lot of benefit. So things like, can a customer have more than one address? And I have vented before, so I'll keep my vent short. <laughs> of, I do live in a rural area where I have a mailing address where I can't get mail and a PO box where I can. And the number of 
times I'm trying to order a product online and I, I can't they can't seem to figure out that one is a shipping address and one is a billing address um, and one is a mailing address um, it confounds me it's getting a little better I think more and more folks there are data patterns out there um, and and I, I recommend using them not necessarily an industry standard data model but at least look at them for an idea. You're not the first person who's ever modeled an address or a phone number. Um, you look at them for ideas because things do change, even as simple as phone numbers. Uh, that second bullet there is a fax number still a required field. I've been in ooh, probably six or seven data modeling uh, workshops this year where that has come up. Do we still track that? Uh, and then to tease the millennials or below on, on a, in the room, what's a fax number? Um, and I kind of feel the same way. I, I often wonder why that is. So many forms still ask for a fax number, and I hated them even when they were popular, and they're not anymore. So <laughs> I've, I've tried to do some uh, banking forms where they don't let you go any further on the form without a fax number. and trying to explain to them I don't have a fax. Um, it's sort of hard, and in this day and age, that's a little crazy. So that's an example of where data modeling can help, you know, just think of your your customer reputation. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be a new hipster biz digital bank, and I'm still asking you for your fax number or your landline. Um, and maybe those are valid, but maybe those have kind of gone the way of the dodo when we want to get those off. Um, so, again, those are the kind of conversations you can have. And, and so many of my, com my customers are doing things like digital transformation and using that data model just for that. Of, and that type of contact information that came up in the beginning of the call um, with Andrew, and I agree with that. How do we contact a customer? What does that mean in this digital age? Is it your social media account? Is it your, is it your text? Do you want a text or do you want an email? All of that type of thing can be hashed out in a data model before we start building stuff that is hard to unravel. So you'll see here you can create simple data models. You know, a customer can place an order and a product can appear on an order. Um, and again, if you're not technical, you can still look at this and pretty much understand that, okay, we have customers ordering products. Get it. Uh, a customer has a first name, and name, last name. Um, does that make sense? Should we store it that way, et cetera? Um, it's just something, and I, won't, I could go all day on any of these, just how we store a name. Um, it can, can, can be complex. Do we have one last name? Do we have two last names? Do we want full middle name? You know, if, if someone has two last names, do you put them both in the one last name? Do we call that surname? Do we call it family name? What is a family? What does that mean? <laughs> Sorry, that's where we start to sound crazy, um, if, <laughs> unless you put that in context. Um, I think one of my customers this week, yeah, we, we, we uh, were at a product development company. We said, yeah, my, my family's going to ask me what we did all day, and I spent all day talk, asking what a product was. <laughs> it can sound kind of academic and, and strange, but until you start to see these subtleties, and that makes so much sense. Um, so I would say pick on a particular example and really highlight some of those use cases. Um, but one thing to avoid, and I touched it earlier, is please don't do this sort of death by data modeling um, and anyone in the business for a while has either gone through these or had to sit through these, and I've, I've met a lot of business stakeholders who are probably uh, PTSD of, or traumatized from some of these experiences where I remember those data models where, you know, you want me to sit in a room where, have been, I've seen those rooms where the data model covers the wall for all three walls and there's thousands of entities, and I just, I know you're busy with your job, but could we just sit down here for a few hours uh, and, and talk about the cardinality of these two data, you know, objects and what the right data types are for this attribute. Funny, they, they don't want to come back. So don't do that to anyone, even developers, anybody <laughs> in case of that. So can we, can we pick you know, each a section of this model and kind of divide it up into smaller chunks or sprints, if you want to call it that, or stories or scenarios? Um, but because these only make sense in context. The other part of having something that big, you lose the context. No human brain can focus on all of that at once, so you want to keep it um, reasonable. So we mentioned that, or I mentioned that um, the, these logical data models are a great kind of first cut to start thinking about some physical, um, but it isn't the physical. One of the nice things from a, a data model is you can go down to the physical level and either create reverse engineer and create an inventory of all the data systems you have. You can start to add definitions to those or, or in, infer the definitions if they're in the you know, the comments if you can, and start to even just build some database consistency. And, and I know this isn't probably the sexiest part of the job, but it can often be the most valuable. Are we all storing part number the same way, or do we have, you know, consistency? And most of these good data modeling tools can create data standards and enforce them across. And, and before you poo-poo that, again, I, I don't want to throw actual names of customers under the bus, um, but we work with a fairly major retailer earlier this year. 
um, where this actually, you know, it was last year, uh, this actually happened in the 21st century. Uh, one of the developers changed the length of the product code and brought down their retail system for a day and think of how much revenue was lost um, because there was no data lifecycle standards for database change management. And, and as you can imagine, that's core master data. And even something as simple as changing the length of a product number uh, can have disastrous effects. And that's where these data models, having that data model review, uh, you can look and do that impact analysis through the model and not have to kind of test that out into the live system. So as we get through to the physical data model, that is where you're starting to look at the different database structures, whether it's the RDBMS, document data store, et cetera. And you do want to start to optimize for query performance. Do we want to put it in third normal form? Um, there's great reasons to do that. If I want to have uh, things accurate and, and, and uh, non-duplicated, I would hope your operation, a lot of your operational systems have some of those checks and balances. Do we want to flatten it out for performance? Do we want to do a key value pair? Do we want to do a dimensional model for reporting? Really think that through. So before you think through how, think of the what. Do we want to reduce redundancy and increase quality? Is that the main goal for this particular data store? Um, do we want to optimize for stores, slice and dice? Do we want to optimize for speed of query? Do we have to choose between those? Can we do all of them at once? I think that's the type of thing you're thinking about when you're down at that uh, physical layer. Um, and then I, I do want to get to this last point, and if I'm allowed, just one rant. I had some mini rants, but this is going to be my full rant. Um, if we, you leave with nothing else, uh, leave with this. And I think Andrew touched on this as well. There, there's so many choices now in the industry, and there's different physical models for different use cases. So there is still a place. And, and We've done some data diversity surveys that relational databases are by no means going away. They're still the workhorse. I think 70% of most you know organizations' data or higher is either on the cloud or on-premise relational databases. Um, and maybe I just want an excuse to use that data modeling cartoon about getting into third normal form because um, I think it's funny. Uh, but there, there's there's reasons for that. And we could have a whole webinar on normalization. But really, to sum it up, it's you're reducing redundancy, you're increasing data quality because you're doing some of those consistency checks. And they're super important. Again, so many of the simple data quality issues could be fixed with some basic normalization and you know, modeling out to really help relational databases do what they do. I mean, we, we generally do start with some sort of reverse engineer uh, in our practice when we do come into a client and look at a system. Um, and a number of models we see without any of those lines um, where people are really using databases like a spreadsheet is sort of disheartening at this day and age when, when the power of the, the whole point of these relational databases are sort of not being used without any of the referential integrity. And so they're great. They're still storing da data, you know, data um, but just make sure you're not modeling it like a glorified Excel spreadsheet um, because there's a lot of power you can do by really adding those relationships. Um, the good old dimensional star schema, um, and again, this could be a whole, where, <laughs> the whole webinar in itself. Uh, there is still value in those, and we use them all the time. Part of the value is the simplicity. If you've never uh, heard of these, when you think of, I'm, I'm a, think of again, using a spreadsheet example, I'm doing a pivot table, and I want to see sales by region and sales by sales rep and sales by you know, country. Um, whenever you're doing a thing by another thing, those are kind of your facts and dimensions. So there's a lot of... Um, you know, debate in the industry, are, are, is this style of data warehouse dead with some of these new platforms that are so much more performant and scalable? You know, maybe you don't need to do this for speed anymore, um, but I think for understanding, um, they're a great way to really, un, you know, have your data in a consumable way, especially for self-service reporting. But I do want to kind of slice and dice this by this by this. Um, no SQL. Um, you know, this is an example Andrew showed earlier, that the great use case for that kind of speed of retrieval, low latency, having that flexibility for change, managing the high data vo volumes, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And there, there's so many ways to store. You could do XML. You could do time series. The good old Cobalt Gall Cockabee book, uh, we laugh, but uh, in an early in my career, I had to learn to read those, never had to write them, just kind of reverse engineer them. Um, but knowing that they still live and breathe, there's still a lot of working mainframes and organizations. So that's where some of these reverse engineering tools can really help you. Um, S3 buckets, Data Vault, that could, again could be a whole um, webinar um, of, kind of how you can use that for kind of some active storage and, and have some different ways to model your schemas. 
et cetera, et cetera. But I think if I were to say one thing, that ne- none of these is inherently better than the other, um, and, and it's your use case that drives what good looks like. Um, and, and I rant about that, um, partly because so many folks learn one of these new ones, and then everything, you know, we have a hammer and everything looks like a nail, and, and people get to be sort of bigoted. Oh, we don't need relational databases now. We do everything um, in NoSQL, or we don't need dimensional now. We have, and you need all of them for that particular use case. And, and as Andrew mentioned earlier, what makes it even more difficult is there's so much overlap now between a lot of the um, – these the vendors, the database vendors, are kind of taking the best of all worlds and kind of mixing. So that's where I like to go back to first principles. What is my use case? What are the data modeling concepts and constructs I'm trying to optimize? And then what tool can use that? Um, uh, not to tease a client, but I did. She, <laughs> when I was working with up in, in Canada, and it was one of these new hot platforms, and she was testing it out, I said, oh, that's great. Yeah, what's your use case for that? And all the guys in the call just laugh, like, ah, you got her. I'm like, why did I get her? It's like, she just wants to play with the, <laughs> play with the software. Well, that's fine, but I was really asking why she, what she was using it for to optimize the business case, and that hadn't been thought through. People just wanted to play with the new technology, which I get. We all do. Um, but just don't go to production in that until you're really mapping it to the right use case. So, you know, hopefully um, thinking of that in terms of use case core principles and what are the po- co- pros and cons of each platform will go a long way. So, um, in summary, the beauty of these data models are the fact that they have this sort of visual uh, way to look at both visual and uh, technical models. Um, and do, uh, make sure to don't mix and match inappropriately. That use your business model for business and technical for technical. And and, um, and the technical is a great way to kind of design these new platforms. And it they're not going away; they're evolving. Uh, but data models are a great way to kind of have that conversation. Uh, either before you're going to production to avoid errors or sort of after you've gone to production to kind of manage change and change management. Before we open it for questions, because I can see it has been a very active chat, as data modeling topics always are, because data models are passionate, uh, just a quick call out to the December. Um, if we can go into more detail in some of these new technologies on how you kind of think about that to build a realistic future state architecture plan. Um, this is us. We do this for a living. And I'll pass it to Shannon to open it up for questions. Donna, thank you so much. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording from today. As And as Donna mentioned, there's a, there will be a link to all the past uh, recordings as well. Uh, so opening it up to both you, Donna, and Andrew, you know, um, uh, would you view a data model as always being an ERD, or does it make sense to model information as an ontology? In as an ontology, um, I'll grab that and then pass it over to Andrew. Um, yeah, good point. We kind of showed some um, ERD-like models. I think that's only one tool in the quiver. I think it's a conceptual model. Uh, often that is kind of good to have that just very high-level core concept of what a customer is, what a client is. Um, there are other, there's UML models that kind of have their, you know, slant and, and they can kind of add with some other uh, different uh, diagrams as well. So, yeah, no, there are. Ontologies are great. They have their use case. Um, but, yeah, we kind of did kind of lean towards the ERD in this particular. I think they're probably the most advanced in terms of some of the tools being on the market. But, yeah, it's just one tool in the quiver and there's a lot of great ways to visualize. Anything you want to add, Andrew, or thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think I think it it, it does depend. Yeah, I'll give the consultant's answer, right? It does depend <laughs> on um, what you're doing and who you're communicating with. I think a lot of times um, the ERDs are a little easier for business users to understand once you get to a certain level of complexity with the ontologies, because I've seen these ontologies where they really, you know, went wild and then, okay, but when I'm trying to understand the complexity or whatever, um, uh, or when I'm trying to understand things simply, sometimes the business users, I think, like the ERDs better, if that makes any sense. I would agree with that. And even within ERDs, I think often us in the techie world can get, you know, we have our favorites or want to get complex. Even like within ERD, I'm a big fan of those crow's feet because that's just so easy for people to say, okay, there's one and there's many, and it looks like, you know, four fingers there or <laughs> fingers of a crow. And, I, yeah, I think if once you keep it simple, it's kind of an easy way. 
we had done a survey with one of uh, my data modeling for the business book, and we took um, uh, six or seven of the different data modeling terminal, and we I just asked some random people, like a carpenter and a teacher, <laughs> what what does this say to you? And the one that everybody could kind of look at and understand was ERD. Um, so I would agree with you. They do seem to be kind of intuitive. But I want to say one more thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would also say let's not be biased about what is a data model. Um, I've found, I've talked to business users, and they'll have a spreadsheet of terms that looks like a hierarchy. That's really a data model. I've had, I, I've given an example, and I had a chef that had kind of, and a marketing uh, team had gotten together and drawn out what they, well, draw it out what they called their data flow, and it looked a whole lot like a data model. They kind of had entities with lines between them. And so I think sometimes just taking off our data modeler hat and looking a little more broadly of it's a thing that has structure that communicates to different users, <laughs> and as long as it has those, back to that core definition, it's a data model, right? It could be an XML schema, that's a data model. Uh, not intuitive to me to, to read one, but um, this tool to visualize that as well. All right, next question before I keep rambling about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so order may have one that more than one product. Is it many to many? If an order may have more than one order, product, yeah. Is it? Just order. Uh, yeah, order may have more than one product. So is it many to many? Uh, I generally see uh, often when you have a, depends how you, you model that out, but order is often one of those intersection or kind of an invoice. So often when you have a many to many, a, 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 you can have an order for more than one product. So what's the thing between that? Um, maybe there's an invoice for that, or a customer can have more than one. Um, so that's kind of how I look at that. If a product can be on more than one order, then, then I would. But, um, yeah, that was a very specific question. <laughs> it kind of threw me off there, but, yeah, it could be. But it, when you do many to many, you just kind of read it backwards, right? Can an order have more than one product? If yes, then that's yes. Can a product be on more than one order? Then yes. And then how would you kind of rationalize that in between? Then what would be the thing to show that this is that particular product on a particular order? Sure. So uh, what might be a good way to ramble about? <laughs> <laughs> and what might be a good way to split the potential complex enterprise data model into chunks? Um, I'm a big fan. A lot of tools are really good at this. Um, when they have tools for it, is kind of create subject areas. So one way might be, and this is this is part of that story I was telling about. Sometimes there's subject areas. I'm going to have the finance model or the, you know. Um, sales model and you kind of can, what, however you define your, your subject area, some people can do it by this is all the stuff that has to do with customer, this is all the stuff that has to do with product. Those are kind of your traditional ways. Um, and often, you know, most of those tools I mentioned earlier, we mentioned earlier in the call have a, um, a concept of uh, subject areas. We break it up at that level. Often they also have a way to kind of do diagrams or visualizations, and they can be hand handy. I often kind of spell them out with some colors, or if you're trying to tell a story, that's another way. This is the model that shows why our email campaign is broken. Um, and then you might even put color if this is where the email goes and, and that kind of thing. So uh, be creative. But, you know, the kind of the academic way would be to break it into kind of business subject areas. Um, and then kind of the more flexible as you're telling the story, often a if you think of the diagram as a visualization and the model or the submodel or those subject areas as kind of the metadata, uh, kind of between those two, you can kind of start to tell that story a little better. I don't know, Andrew, did you have thoughts on that? Sorry, my connection cut out during the question. Oh. Uh, they were talking about what a good way, if you have an enterprise data model, to kind of break it up into chunks. I didn't know if you had opinions on that. Yeah, I don't. I I I uh, kind of in the past just sort of uh, looked at the the overall use cases, and then um, uh, the things that were most most related to use cases tended to go on one side or the other. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for a couple more questions here. So. Um, Uh, using industry standard asset data models, such as uh, so, um, any suggestions on approach or tips for modeling big data? So, 
for modeling big data, that's such a, a broad term. We actually have a webinar on that in the archives. Um, so at the conceptual level, I think big data, it can. I almost see the conceptual is going across all of those platforms. So we have customer data, we have a product, and then big data is an instance of that. Um, so, you know, I, I have some of my, I don't know, some of my customer data um, is coming in through IoT medical devices or something like that. So, or patient data that would be. Um, um, big data is often, uh, what do you call it, schema on read. So generally there's some sort of schema you can kind of create at your hive table, you know, that type of thing. You can kind of create some sort of structure and then read it that way. And then a lot of the kind of, you know, big data is so broad we could have a whole conversation. Um, some of the more kind of cloud-based, even, um, I don't know, even your S3 buckets and things like that have some ideas of kind of metadata tagging and some light structures, and they have some actually some decent metadata tools right in the tool. I, I see that more as the physical layer. Um, I would I would probably use one of those old kind of ER tools for the conceptual layer, and then depending on how you're storing that big data, if it's in kind of a hive structure, it's easy to kind of quote reverse engineer. But some of the more you know platform specific actually have some starting to get starting to get some good um, metadata around that as well. Um, and Andrew, before you jump in here, I just kind of want to expand on that because, as you mentioned, conceptual, you know, the conceptual is somewhat easy and the physical is uh, the physical implementation, but how can we create a logical model for Hadoop data lake, so our data lake in general, um, you know, that goes along the lines with that big data question? Um, and then that would probably be my same answer of a, well, uh, as the conceptual, but you still have the core business rule and data lake. Oh, I just like cringe at that term that everyone has such a different definition. And I guess we're not. None of us is talking about a data swamp where there's no documentation. But at a data lake, you still need to understand uh, the core business rules around a customer and, and what that. Uh, you know, can they have more than one email? How is that stored? So if you're thinking logical, you're th still thinking data structures. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I just an example. We had one customer, and they were doing some kind of big data testing. They're just kind of throwing it out on the cloud with some credit card data for analysis. Uh, and one of the one of the analysts said, "Oh, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to do that because it was PCI. They actually put the real credit cards." And that was something that kind of a more logical model would have said, "This goes here, that goes there." But you know, it, it's tr to me, that's kind of true. Big data is sort of it would be schema on read, and you're doing it as you build the data. So it's kind of a different way to look at things. It's not I build the data and then I put it in big. <laughs> I build the logical and then I put it on big data. It's like you have big data and then you have to kind of put it into a, a model structure before you use it. You know. Yeah, and I would say that despite the schema on on read. Uh, uh, hype a little bit with um, with Hadoop in particular, but but in general, there is some physical structure there, whether it be a file system and files with directories and files and what have you, or if you go to Hive where it pretty much does look like a, a relational database, all not although in many ways not a very good one. Um, <laughs> I uh, have to agree with that. Database uh, standpoint, um, uh, the, you know, and those are the essentially physical models. So, so there is something there to map, and the idea that, you know, a lot of these uh, Hadoop data lake what have you systems, they've been used for a few different purposes, and the definitions are a few little bit different. In another life, I, I implemented a, a few of them, but, um, but uh, a lot of them. Are being used as sort of almost a a poor man's informatica in in some cases and what have you. So you can kind of go back to some of those techniques, and in the other case, they're they're being used as a, sort of a, a poor man's teradata. Um, so you can you can look at some of that, but map it more to a file system structure or or to Hive. I love it. And that does bring us to the top of the hour. I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Thank you, Donna, so much as always for a great presentation. And thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. It's been a 
absolutely great. Uh, and thanks to Catchplace for sponsoring to help make all this happen. And of course, thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the, the chat and the questions that have come in today. Uh, and again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Hope everybody has a great day. Again, Andrew and Donna, thank you so much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Thank you, all. It's a pleasure. Bye.